Chapter 60 The Spurned Suitor The hour of ghosts was almost upon them when Sir Garris Drinkwater returned to the pyramid to report that he had found beans, books, and old Bill Bone in one of Meereen's less savory cellars, drinking yellow wine and watching naked slaves kill one another with bare hands and filed teeth. Beans pulled a blade and proposed a wager to determine if deserters had bellies full of yellow slime, Sir Garris reported. So I tossed him a dragon and asked if yellow gold would do. He bit the coin and asked what I meant to buy. When I told him, he slipped the knife away and asked if I was drunk or mad. Let him think what he wants so long as he delivers the message, said Quentin. He'll do that much. I'll wager you get your meeting, too. If only so rags can have pretty Maris cut your liver out and fry it up with onions. We should be heeding Selmy. When Barristan the Bold tells you to run, a wise man laces up his boots. We should find a ship for Volantis whilst the port is still open. Just the mention turned Sir Archibald's cheeks green. No more ships. I'd sooner hop back to Volantis on one foot. Volantis, Quentin thought. Then lease, then home. Back the way I came, empty-handed. Three brave men dead. For what? It would be sweet to see the green blood again. To visit Sunspear in the water gardens and breathe the clean, sweet mountain air of Ironwood in place of the hot, wet, filthy humors of Slaver's Bay. His father would speak no word of rebuke, Quentin knew, but the disappointment would be there in his eyes. His sister would be scornful. The sand snakes would mock him with smiles sharp as swords. And Lord Ironwood, his second father, who had sent his own son along to keep him safe, I will not keep you here, Quentin told his friends. My father laid this task on me, not you. Go home, if that's what you want, by whatever means you like. I am staying. The big man shrugged. Then drink and me are staying too. The next night, Denzo Don turned up at Prince Quentin's door to talk terms. He will meet with you on the morrow by the spice market. Look for a door marked with a purple lotus. Knock twice and call for freedom. Agreed, said Quentin. Arch and Garris will be with me. He can bring two men as well, no more. If it please my prince. The words were polite enough, but Denzo's tone was edged with malice and the eyes of the warrior poet gleamed bright with mockery. Come at sunset and see that you are not followed. The Dornishmen left the Great Pyramid an hour shy of sunset, in case they took a wrong turn or had difficulty finding the Purple Lotus. Quentin and Garrus wore their sword belts. The big man had his warhammer slung across his broad back. It is still not too late to abandon this folly, Garrus said, as they made their way down a feeded alley toward the old spice market. The smell of piss was in the air, and they could hear the rumble of a corpse cart's iron-rimmed wheels off ahead. Old Bill Bone used to say that pretty Maris could stretch out a man's dying for a moon's turn. We lied to them, Quent. Used them to get us here, then went over to the storm crows, as we were commanded. Tatters never meant for us to do it for real, though, put in the big man. His other boys, Sir Orson and Dick Straw, Hungerford, Will of the Woods, that lot, they're still down in some dungeon thanks to us. Old Rags can't have liked that much. No, Prince Quentin said. But he likes gold. Garrus laughed. A pity we have none. Do you trust this piece, Quent? I don't. 
Half the city is calling the Dragon Slayer a hero, and the other half spits blood at the mention of his name. Harzu, the big man said. Quentin frowned. His name was Hargaz. He's dar, humzum, hagnag, what does it matter? I called them all Harzu. He was no dragon slayer. All he did was get his arse roasted black and crispy. He was brave. Would I have the courage to face that monster with nothing but a spear? He died bravely, is what you mean. He died screaming, said Arch. Garrus put a hand on Quentin's shoulder. Even if the queen returns, she'll still be married. Not if I give King Harzu a little smack with my hammer, suggested the big man. Hisdar, said Quentin. His name is Hisdar. One kiss from my hammer and no one will care what his name was, said Arch. They do not see. His friends had lost sight of his true purpose here. The road leads through her, not to her. Daenerys is the means to the prize, not the prize itself. The dragon has three heads, she said to me. My marriage need not be the end of all your hopes, she said. I know why you are here, for fire and blood. I have Targaryen blood in me, you know that. I can trace my lineage back. Fuck your lineage, said Garrus. The dragons won't care about your blood, except maybe how it tastes. You cannot tame a dragon with a history lesson. They're monsters, not maesters. Quent, is this truly what you want to do? This is what I have to do. For Dorn, for my father, for Cletus and Will and Maester Kedri. They're dead, said Garrus. They won't care. All dead, Quentin agreed. For what? To bring me here, so I might wed the Dragon Queen. A grand adventure, Cletus called it. Demon roads and stormy seas, and at the end of it the most beautiful woman in the world. A tale to tell our grandchildren. But Cletus will never father a child unless he left a bastard in the belly of that tavern when she liked. Will will never have his wedding. Their death should have some meaning. Garrus pointed to where a corpse slumped against a brick wall, attended by a cloud of glistening green flies. Did his death have meaning? Quentin looked at the body with distaste. He died of the flux. Stay well away from him. The pale mare was inside the city walls. Small wonder that the streets seemed so empty. The Unsullied will send a corpse guard for him. No doubt, but that was not my question. Men's lives have meaning, not their deaths. I loved Will and Cletus too, but this will not bring them back to us. This is a mistake, Quent. You cannot trust in sellsword. They are men like any other men. They want gold, glory, power. That's all I am trusting in. That and my own destiny. I am a prince of Dorne, and the blood of dragons is in my veins. The sun had sunk below the city wall by the time they found the purple lotus. Painted on the weathered wooden door of a low brick hovel squatting amidst a row of similar hovels in the shadow of the great yellow and green pyramid of Rosdar. Quentin knocked twice, as instructed. A gruff voice answered through the door, growling something unintelligible in the mongrel tongue of Slaver's Bay, an ugly blend of old Giscari and High Valyrian. The prince answered in the same tongue. Freedom. The door opened. Garrus entered first, for caution's sake, with Quentin close behind him and the big man bringing up the rear. Within, the air was hazy with bluish smoke, whose sweet smell could not quite cover up the deeper stinks of piss and sour wine and rotting meat. The space was much larger than it had seemed from without, 
stretching off to right and left into the adjoining hovels. What had appeared to be a dozen structures from the street turned into one long hall inside. At this hour, the house was less than half full. A few of the patrons favored the Dornishmen with looks bored or hostile or curious. The rest were crowded around the pit at the far end of the room, where a pair of naked men were slashing at each other with knives whilst the watchers cheered them on. Quentin saw no sign of the men they had come to meet. Then a door he had not seen before swung open, and an old woman emerged. A shriveled thing in a dark red tokar fringed with tiny golden skulls. Her skin was white as mare's milk, her hair so thin that he could see the scalp beneath. "'Darn!' she said. "'I be Zarina, purple lotus. Go down here, you find them.' She held the door and gestured them through. Beyond was a flight of wooden steps, steep and twisting. This time the big man led the way, and Garrus was the rear guard, with the prince between them. An undercellar. It was a long way down, and so dark that Quentin had to feel his way to keep from slipping. Near the bottom, Sir Archibald pulled his dagger. They emerged in a brick vault thrice the size of the wine sink above. Huge wooden vats lined the walls as far as the prince could see. A red lantern hung on a hook just inside the door, and a greasy black candle flickered on an overturned barrel serving as a table. That was the only light. Cago Corpse Killer was pacing by the wine vats, his black rock hanging at his hip. Pretty Maris stood cradling a crossbow, her eyes as cold and dead as two gray stones. Denzo Don barred the door once the Dornishmen were inside, then took up a position in front of it, arms crossed against his chest. One too many, Quentin thought. The tattered prince himself was seated at the table, nursing a cup of wine. In the yellow candlelight, his silver-gray hair seemed almost golden, though the pouches underneath his eyes were etched as large as saddlebags. He wore a brown wool traveler's cloak, with silvery chainmail glimmering underneath. Did that betoken treachery or simple prudence? An old sellsword is a cautious sellsword. Quentin approached his table. My lord? You look different without your cloak, my ragged raiment. The Pentoshi gave a shrug. A poor thing, yet those tatters fill my foes with fear, and on the battlefield the sight of my rags blowing in the wind emboldens my men more than any banner. And if I want to move unseen... I need only slip it off to become plain and unremarkable. He gestured at the bench across from him. Sit. I understand you are a prince. Would that I had known. Will you drink? Zarina offers food as well. Her bread is stale and her stew is unspeakable. Grease and salt with a morsel or two of meat. Dog, she says, but I think rat is more likely. It will not kill you, though. I have found that it is only when the food is tempting that one must beware. Poisoners invariably choose the choicest dishes. You brought three men, Sir Garrus pointed out, with an edge in his voice. We agreed on two apiece. Maris is no man. Maris, sweet, undo your shirt, show him. That will not be necessary, said Quentin. If the talk he had heard was true, beneath that shirt pretty Maris had only the scars left by the men who cut her breasts off. Maris is a woman, I agree. You've still twisted the terms. Tattered and twisty. What a rogue I am. Three to two is not much of an advantage, it must be admitted, but it counts for something. In this world, 
a man must learn to seize whatever gifts the gods chose to send him. That was a lesson I learned at some cost. I offer it to you as a sign of my good faith. He gestured at the chair again. Sit and say what you came to say. I promise not to have you killed until I have heard you out. That is the least I can do for a fellow prince. Quentin, is it? Quentin of House Martel. Frog suits you better. It is not my custom to drink with liars and deserters, but you've made me curious. Quentin sat. One wrong word, and this could turn to blood in half a heartbeat. I ask your pardon for our deception. The only ships sailing for Slaver's Bay were those that had been hired to bring you out to the wars. The tattered prince gave a shrug. Every turn cloak has his tail. You are not the first to swear me your swords, take my coin, and run. All of them have reasons. My little son is sick, or... My wife is putting horns on me, or the other men or make me suck their cocks. Such a charming boy, the last, but I did not excuse his desertion. Another fellow told me our food was so wretched that he had to flee before it made him sick. So I had his foot cut off, roasted it up, and fed it to him. Then I made him our camp cook. Our meals improved markedly. And when his contract was fulfilled, he signed another. You, though. Several of my best are locked up in the Queen's dungeon thanks to that lying tongue of yours. And I doubt that you can even cook. I am a prince of Dorn, said Quentin. I had a duty to my father and my people. There was a secret marriage pact. So I heard. And when the Silver Queen saw your scrap of parchment, she fell into your arms, yes? No, said Pretty Maris. No? Oh, I recall. Your bride flew off on a dragon. Well, when she comes... Do be sure to invite us to your nuptials. The men of the company would love to drink to your happiness. And I do love a Westerosi wedding. The bedding part especially. Only... Oh, wait. He turned to Denzo Don. Denzo, I thought you told me that the Dragon Queen had married some Giscari. A Miranese nobleman, rich. The tattered prince turned back to Quentin. Could that be true? Surely not. What of your marriage pact? She laughed at him, said Pretty Maris. Daenerys never laughed. The rest of Meereen might see him as an amusing curiosity like the exiled Summer Islander King Robert used to keep at King's Landing. But the Queen had always spoken to him gently. We came too late, said Quentin. A pity you did not desert me sooner. The tattered prince sipped at his wine. So, no wedding for Prince Frog. Is that why you've come hopping back to me? Have my three brave Dornish lads decided to honor their contracts? No. How vexing. Yorka Zoyunzak is dead. Ancient tidings. I saw him die. The poor man saw a dragon and stumbled as he tried to flee. Then a thousand of his closest friends stepped on him. No doubt the Yellow City is awash in tears. Did you ask me here to toast his memory? No. Have the Junkishmen chosen a new commander? The Council of Masters has been unable to agree. 
a Yezonzo Kagaz at the Mosipo. But now he's died as well. The wise masters are rotating the supreme command amongst themselves. Today our leader is the one your friends in the ranks dubbed the Drunken Conqueror. On the morrow it will be Lord Wobblecheeks. The rabbit, said Maris. Wobblecheeks was yesterday. I stand corrected, my sweetling. Our Yunkish friends were kind enough to provide us with a chart. I must strive to be more assiduous about consulting it. Your Kazu Yunzak was the man who hired you. He signed our contract on behalf of his city. Just so. Merin and Yunkai have made peace. The siege is to be lifted. The armies disbanded. There will be no battle, no slaughter. No city to sack and plunder. Life is full of disappointments. How long do you think the Yunkishmen will want to continue paying wages to four free companies? The tattered prince took a sip of wine and said, A vexing question. But this is the way of life for we men of the free companies. One war ends, another begins. Fortunately, there is always someone fighting someone somewhere. Perhaps here. Even as we sit here drinking, Bloodbeard is urging our Yunkish friends to present King Hizdar with another head. Freedmen and slaves eye each other's necks and sharpen their knives. The sons of the harpy plot in their pyramids. The pale mare rides down slave and lord alike. Our friends from the yellow city gaze out to sea, and somewhere in the grasslands a dragon nibbles on the tender flesh of the Daenerys Targaryen. Who rules Merin tonight? Who will rule it on the morrow? The Pentashi gave a shrug. One thing I am certain of. Someone will have need of our swords. I have need of those swords. Dorn will hire you. The tattered prince glanced at pretty Maris. He does not lack for gold, this frog. Must I remind him? My dear prince, the last contract we signed... You used to wipe your pretty pink bottom. I will double whatever the Yunkishmen are paying you. And pay in gold upon the signing of our contract, yes? I will pay you part when we reach Volantis, the rest when I am back in Sunsphere. We brought gold with us when we set sail, but it would have been hard to conceal once we joined the company. So we gave it over to the banks. I can show you papers... Ah, papers. But we will be paid double. Twice as many papers, said Pretty Maris. The rest you'll have in Dorn, Quentin insisted. My father is a man of honor. If I put my seal to an agreement, he will fulfill its terms. You have my word on that. The tattered prince finished his wine, turned the cup over, and set it down between them. So let me see if I understand. A proven liar, an oathbreaker, wishes to contract with us and pay in promises. And for what services? I wonder. Are my wind blown to smash the Unkai and sack the Yellow City? Defeat a Dosraki Kalasar in the field? Escort you home to your father? Or will you be content if we deliver Queen Daenerys to your bed wet and willing? Tell me true, Prince Frog. What would you have of me and mine? I need you to help me steal a dragon. Kago Corpse Killer chuckled. Pretty Maris curled her lip in a half smile. Denzo Don whistled. The tattered prince only leaned back on his stool and said, Double does not pay for dragons, prancling. Even a frog should know that much. Dragons come dear. 
A man who pay in promises should have at least the sense to promise more. If you want me to triple what I want, said the tattered prince, is pentos.